Hello everybody, I am your professor Dave Cacciarella for an introduction to Earth Science. This is Chapter 5 from the textbook Foundations of Earth Science brought to you by Pearson Education and written by Lutkins and Tarbuck. It is the 8th edition and in Chapter 5 we are looking at plate tectonics, the grand unifying theory of geology. And we will learn how we went from the concept of continental drift and all the different types of science that added on over 10, 20, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years to lead us from this idea of continental drift to the theory of plate tectonics. So it's an amazing journey and it really is the crux of geology and helps us to understand so many of the geologic features on Earth that we'll be studying. Before 1960, geologists basically believed that the oceans and the continents were fixed. They'd always been that way and they would never change. This idea of continental drift suggested something completely different. It provided a whole new model of the processes that were occurring on Earth. And literally, it was a scientific revolution, taking us from this idea of the Earth being fixed to one in which tectonics literally deformed the crust and created major structural features. Now, it wasn't in the 1960s when this was first thought of. As a matter of fact, as far back as the 1600s, world maps suggested that South America and Africa would fit together very nicely. It was in 1915 when, it, when a meteorologist named Alfred Wegener uh, wrote a book and outlined his hypothesis of continental drift, suggesting that there was a single supercontinent called Pangaea. Some people pronounce it Pangaea, but we're going to go with Pangaea. Pangaea literally means all land, and that supercontinent was one big clump of land that fragmented some 200 million years ago and drifted apart into smaller pieces that are the existing continents and, and subcontinents that we know today. And his uh, drawing from 1915 below and sort of a new modern reconstruction of Pangaea uh, is here. And so the idea is that a supercontinent rifted and pulled apart and the separate pieces drifted and continue to drift. To this day, they're still drifting, but drifted to their present positions. And, and you can see here uh, the very first piece of evidence known as the fit of, confident, of continents. This is a piece of evidence, just looking at it, you can see that these continents very likely fit together, um, very similar between the coastlines on opposite sides of the Atlantic. Now, the opponents of this hypothesis said that coastlines are modified through time and by erosion and by deposition, and the, the proponents actually agreed. They said it really isn't the exact coastline that fits together, but really the continental shelf. And in this illustration, we use the continental shelf and it shows just really a, a remarkable fit of South America and Africa from 200 million years ago. Now, a second piece of evidence was this idea of matching features, and one of those matching features were fossils that were found on opposite sides of the ocean. So South America and Africa, we had fossils of this creature, the Mesosaurus, on both sides, and it's very difficult to explain how this particular creature that has specific climate and lived during a fairly short period of time could be the exactly the same creature on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. And then we had uh, other creatures and some plants that essentially the same situation. Their fossils were found on multiple different continents. And paleontologists, even at the time, agreed that there had to have been some land connection to explain that particular part of the fossil record of course, Wegener explained it through continental drift. So that Mesosaurus was the, that small little aquatic freshwater reptile. Uh, it's found in eastern South America and western Africa. We had the fern in Africa, Australia, India, South America, and Antarctica. Um, and these other fossils, opponents of this theory provided these different solutions. Perhaps those creatures rafted from one continent to the other, or perhaps they were literally land bridges from one continent to the other, or there were islands and the creatures were able to use those islands or stepping stone, as stepping stones. But, you know, today what we know is not necessarily continental drift as Wegener explained it, because his mechanism for continental drift really wasn't correct, but his general thinking was that the land masses we see today are not the land masses that existed 200 million years ago and further back in geologic time. So, a third piece of evidence um, was this idea of rock types and specific geologic features, the way different strata of rock were lined up, that you would find, again, on opposite sides of the same ocean. 
mountain belts like the Appalachians would disappear at the coastline and then reappear across the Atlantic Ocean as the Caledonian Mountains. And the age of the rocks and the types of the rocks and the way the strata were layered in those rocks um, appear to be very, very similar. Uh, and so this is one of those, those geologic features and rock types that fit across oceans. 2.2 billion year old igneous rock in Brazil and also in Africa and then mountain belts that again they stop at the coastline and then reappear on the other side of the ocean. And one of the other pieces of uh, information or one of the pieces of data that came about was the evidence of glaciation and we saw we find evidence of glaciation at tropical latitudes. For instance we find uh, glaciation on the continent of Africa right at the equator. Glaciation, evidence of glaciation uh, on India uh, and also southern Australia. And these are, are areas that were too far away from the poles to be glaciated because we know that at the same times that these glacial striations and these glacial evidence existed that were there were coal swamps in what would have been more uh, tropical locations. So the entire globe wasn't covered in ice because we had coal swamps as well. So how could we explain this glaciation at the equator? Well, if we, we rearrange the continents as Pangaea with a good bit of them over the southern oceans as it's hypothesized that they were, that would explain those glaciers from Antarctica. And also it would explain how in northern parts of North America we had coal swamps because we reconstruct Pangaea and we see those coal swamps straddling, straddling the equator. Wegener's hypothesis was met with Criticism, for one thing, he was a meteorologist and not a geologist. And back in those days, the Earth wasn't seen as multiple systems all interacting. So that was bad science. He was attacked because he was a meteorologist. So as opposed to attacking the science, they were attacking the scientists. But one of the major issues that we had um, back in the 1915-1920s was that, that Wegener could not provide a good natural mechanism for continental drift. There's a couple of theories that were advanced, and one was that the, the continental crust literally moved through the oceanic crust, and he, and he literally used the analogy of the continental crust being like a ship plowing through the ocean of the oceanic crust, as in this continental crust was so hard that it could actually move through the oceanic crust, uh, much like these icebreakers that we see over here on the right. Another theory was that since the Earth is spinning, the centrifugal force of that spinning, just like you know this particular fair ride before the whole fair begin, before the whole ride begins to spin, you're hanging straight down. As it spins faster and faster, you get pulled further and further out. Centrifugal force, uh, which is essentially a lack of centripetal force, and we'll study that if you get my meteorology class. Uh, bottom line is the centrifugal force was thought maybe it was causing the continents to move around, but those weren't good solid uh, natural mechanisms to explain the movement of the continents. So while others still considered this particular hypothesis, it was largely ignored. And then after World War II, with a vast amount of money and resources and a whole bunch of generals who wanted some serious answers about the natural world, because at times in that war, the uh, natural environment was as much of an enemy as the enemy itself, um, the U.S. government went on a pretty significant period of ocean exploration and, and other types of exploration as well. And that ocean exploration allowed us to, to discover a great number of things. And one of those things is this oceanic trench system. So before this period of ocean exploration, it was believed that the entire ocean, the entire basin of the ocean was one big, flat, deep abyss. Well, taking soundings going across the ocean, what we found was in most of our oceans, and if you follow my cursor here, this is what's known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it is literally the largest single topographical feature on Earth. It literally winds across all oceans and into all oceans, and it is, uh, not only is it about two to three kilometers high, but it's uh, a, a thousand or, or so wide. So it's a significant feature. I know it looks small in this picture. So the first thing that was discovered was that Mid-Ocean Ridge. We also began to discover that there were earthquakes in the Western Pacific along some of these trenches that we see. And there's a trench here in the Aleutians and a trench here 
uh, with Japan and down in the Philippines and, of course, the Mariana and Tongan Trench, trenches we never knew existed. Also, there's a deep, deep ocean trench right here just off the west coast of South America. And we discovered not only those trenches, but we discovered that uh, deep, huge earthquakes happened very, very deep in the Earth's crust. Well, not the crust, no, down into the mantle, um, along those trenches. Something else we discovered is that the crust all this oceanic crust, none of it was more than 180 to upwards of 200 million years old, but 180 is the accepted number. Whereas we were able to pull rocks from near, well, in Australia, from near the Hudson Bay, that dated back more than 4 billion years. So this is a 180 million years oceanic compared to uh, 4,000 million years in terms of what's going on in the continent. So we discovered that the ocean, oceanic crust was very, very young compared to the continents. And we also had the expectation, just as the way we did, that the ocean would be flat and very, very deep. We had the expectation that there'd be a very, very, very thick layer from billions, you know, millions, billions of years of sediment accumulation. And that wasn't the case at all. As a matter of fact, at this oceanic ridge, which was made the ocean quite shallow at the ridge, there was very, very thin sediment and it got thicker as you moved away. And, and speaking of the ocean not being flat, the oceanic ridge goes all the way up into north, the North Atlantic where it actually protrudes out of the ocean in the form of Iceland. Iceland are just the tops of the oceanic ridge that we find in the North Atlantic. So all of these features on the seafloor really help lead to the development that there are plates of Earth crust that are that are moving around and it was a much more comprehensive and encompassing theory than continental drift and and this is this is how the theory goes what we believe so it's really is a very important part of geology something you need to have a an understanding of we talk about the earth being density stratified meaning the composition of the earth materials are different causing those materials to have a different density as you go from the core to the mantle to the crust. And the core is mostly nickel and iron and therefore very heavy, very dense. And the asthenus, the, uh, the mantle, I'm sorry, the mantle is less dense than the core, a very thick layer of mantle, but it's, but it's more dense than the continental crust and, and even the oceanic crust. And what we learn is that the crust of the earth is the least dense. Well, we have to take that a step further when we want to to identify and classify the structure of the Earth based on not just the composition and density, but how it actually behaves. And how it actually behaves is based on temperature and pressure and composition. And you may recall that the core of the Earth is solid nickel and iron, but there's a liquid portion of the core that surrounds the solid core that actually spins faster around the solid core that helps to create our magnetic field. Again, part of the core solid, part of the core liquid, and then the mantle from the core mantle boundary all the way up uh, to maybe two to 300 to 400 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. So all that mantle rock is solid rock. And then you get up to this area, the very upper edge of the mantle. And in that upper edge of the mantle, it, it does some interesting, interesting things. It behaves in an interesting way. And what we have is a portion of the upper mantle that is weak and that uh, rocks are near their melting temperatures because they're deep. And they're literally plastic. They're part of what's known as the asthenosphere. And then just above the asthenosphere, because this mantle rock is very close to the surface and it's quite cool compared to the rock below and under very little pressure compared to the rock below, then part of the mantle rock, the very thinnest edge of the mantle rock is actually rigid, strong, and, and solid. And then, of course, on top of the mantle, you have the third layer of the Earth, which is your crust, whether it's oceanic or it's continental. So this line is going to separate the crust, whether it's oceanic or continental crust. And yes, the as you can see, the uh, continental crust is thicker. It's less dense and it's definitely, le it's definitely thicker. That line separates the crust from the mantle. So this is crust, and this is all mantle down here, all right? But because of temperature and pressure differences, this part 
of the, of the mantle. This is mantle rock. This part of the mantle rock is rigid, strong and rigid. And of course, continental crust is also rigid. And oceanic crust is also rigid. And in reality, the oceanic and continental crust, the Earth's crust is literally sutured or stuck to because both the crust and the very, very uppermost mantle, this 100 kilometers of the mantle, they are sutured together in what is known as the lithosphere, all right? So these two together, the lithosphere, and everything beneath that is going to be the asthenosphere. And so the theory of tectonics breaks the composition of the Earth down into two very specific zones in the uppermost portion of the Earth. One is the lithosphere, and the second is the asthenosphere. And the asthenosphere, this, this portion down here at the bottom, is hotter and weaker mantle rock that is just below the lithosphere. And about 1% of the minerals are actually melted. So the rocks are, are weak, they're near their melting point, but only about 1% are actually melted. And what this does is it makes this layer of the very upper mantle almost plastic. It makes it very malleable. It makes it movable. And this lithosphere on top of it is completely rigid. And so it's rigid and it's, and it's heavy and it sinks down into, just like a boat does, this thicker continental crust sinks further down in, the less... A uh, thick oceanic crust doesn't sink as far in. It, it, it sinks into, this lithosphere sinks into the mantle, almost like a boat sinking into the ocean. And most importantly, this lithosphere then, it works independently of the asthenosphere. And it's this lithosphere that represents our tectonic plates. So essentially, this is what is your tectonic plate. This is your plate, and the tectonic plate rides on the asthenosphere. Now, the tectonic plate and individual tectonic plate can be both oceanic lithosphere and continental lithosphere. As a matter of fact, most plates are a combination of both. There's some plates that are all only oceanic lithosphere, but most plates are a combination, actually, of both. Uh, and so that lithospheric plate will ride on top of the asthenosphere. So the asthenosphere is continuous across the entire globe. It's the lithosphere that is broken up into separate plates. So the plates move as rigid units relative to other plates. So they move by and into and away from all the other plates on Earth. And again, remember, the Earth is a sphere. It's not flat like you see here. So they, they're all moving into or away from or around each other. And you have seven major plates, uh, the Pacific plate, the Antarctic plate, South American, North American. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is the Eurasian plate on both sides. And the, uh, the Indo-Australian plates and smaller plates, and the Nazcas, the Cocos, the Caribbean plate. There's a little plate right here called the, uh, the Juan de Fuca plate. So there's, there's, a, there's a number of smaller plates, but these are the big ones. Um, and they make up about 94% of the Earth. And they're either moving um, toward each other or away from each other or into each other. And so let me just give you a couple of, for instances, of what's happening uh, with these plates. Here in the Atlantic Ocean, there is that mid-ocean ridge. And remember, there's, there is Iceland. Here, these plates are moving away from each other, all right? These plates are diverging, they're moving away. This ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, is getting bigger, all right? These plates are moving away from each other. Conversely, um, oops, that's arrows in the wrong direction, that's going that way. So this whole South American plate is going that direction. Conversely, this little Nazca plate is moving into the South American plate. So this is a divergent boundary. Now here we have a convergent boundary where they're coming together. They're actually moving into each other. There's, and that's a situation where oceanic plate, because the Nazca is all oceanic, the Pacific is all oceanic. This oceanic plate is converging with a continental plate. You can also have a continental plate here, India, converging with a, a continental plate, Eurasia. And so 
there are features that form where you have those two plates converging. Where these plates converge, the Andes form. When these plates converge, the Himalayas have formed. And so again, tectonics explains a great number of the different features that we find on the Earth's surface. And so here's just a slightly different view of that, uh, the same plates. Again, the Cocos, Caribbean, the Juan de Fuca, the Nazca, some of your smaller ones, the Scotia, the Arabian, and then your big ones, the Eurasian, the North American, the Pacific, the Australian Indian, South American, African plates, uh, plates moving apart, and, and, and they are color-coded. So where you have blue, you have convergent plate boundaries. Okay, where you have red, you have divergent uh, plate boundaries. And the greens, what we're going to learn about are transform plate boundaries where they're sliding past each other. So again, remember I talked about the Nazca. Here they're converging and the Andes have been built. Um, here, here's India over here. India is converging with Eurasia and the Himalayas. And not only the Himalayas, but the whole Himalayan plateau uh, was built. We also have mountain ranges where the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath the North American plate. That, that collision right there creates the Cascade Mountain Range, of which we still have active volcanoes. The Andes, of which we still have active volcanoes. But interestingly enough, where two continental plates collide, you don't have active volcanoes because uh, they, they just kind of bunch up and smash together. And so our major plates will either diverge or they'll spread apart from each other. They'll converge. In the case of convergence, if it's oceanic, and continental are oceanic and oceanic, like we have oceanic here, this blue line here, all through here is where oceanic is converging with oceanic. Uh, you're gonna get one subducting under the other. In the rare case of, of continental and continental colliding, there's not gonna be any subduction, there's just gonna be crumpling. But here is your convergent plate boundary, and then your last one, your transform plate boundaries are sliding by each other. So the natural mechanism for this is the upwelling of magma through the mantle. And in the case of all of these ocean, mid-ocean, the mid-Atlantic ridge, the East Pacific rise, the Southwest Indian ridge, those mid-ocean ridges, those diverging plate boundaries, in all those situations, the boundaries are spreading apart because magma is welling up and splitting the crust, splitting the lithosphere, because remember, this is the oceanic lithosphere, splitting the lithosphere and causing it to move apart. Here, where this oceanic lithosphere converges with this continental lithosphere, this whole oceanic lithosphere is being subducted down into the mantle, where eventually it's consumed and melted in the deepest mantle. So here, lithosphere is actually being created, while here, lithosphere is being consumed and neither is happening with the transform boundary. So this is the divergent boundary, this blue line, that's the transform boundary, they're sliding past each other. Now, there's some very specific features that occur at plate boundaries. Because of the subduction of one plate and the melting that occurs in the mantle above the subducting plate, you get magma that flows up and mountain chains and volcanoes. And you have that whether it's an oceanic lithosphere converging with a, a continental lithosphere like in South America, or if the Pacific Oceanic Lithosphere is converging with the Atlantic Oceanic Lithosphere, you get island chains of volcanoes that form, like the Aleutians, or like uh, Japan, or like the Philippines. Um, even New Zealand is part of a plate boundary in which oceanic is subducting under oceanic, and you're getting, um, you're getting those nice island chains. And so another feature is going to be volcanoes. Well, another feature is, in addition to volcanoes, is going to be, as these plates are subducting, this plate's going underneath it, they're, they're rubbing together, and the friction between them causes earthquakes, and in some cases, very deep earthquakes. As these slide by each other, you get earthquakes. As these move apart, you get volcanism, at least volcanoes where magmas wind up, at least heat flow at the very least, but you also get some earthquake activity as well. So the, these boundaries... Are, are very um, key for understanding not only where the, the different tectonic plates are moving, but in the case of this map, all these dots are active volcanoes. They're active volcanoes where there's some convergence going along, and this is what's known as the Pacific Ring of Fire. And you'll also find a similar lining up of features of earthquakes, basically at the same areas. So 
Tectonics really does explain a lot for us. Uh, plate movement, of course, the interaction between plates and plate boundaries. You have your divergent boundaries. Those are constructive margins. That's where, where, where lithosphere is being created. Mostly oceanic lithosphere, there is one divergent plate boundary that's on a continent. That's the East African area and the East African rift zone. We'll show you that in a couple minutes. But these are constructive margins. Two plates move apart. Upwelling of hot material from the mantle creates new seafloor. All right? Divergent plate boundaries. Convergent plate boundaries are destructive because one of the plates of the two that are moving together will be subducted and you will uh, have some of that lithosphere, uh, oceanic lithosphere being consumed. Oceanic lithosphere dis descends and is reabsorbed into the mantle. Um, if two continental blocks converge, you're going to get crumpling and, um, and deform deformation, deforming of the of the continental crust and you're going to get a mountain belt. And then the transform plate boundaries are considered conservative. They don't destroy or create mantle. In that case, the two plates slide past each other and no lithosphere is created or, or destroyed. All right, so first we're going to talk in detail about divergent plate boundaries and essentially seafloor spreading. And so here is North America and Florida and the continental shelf and the continental rise and the big deep abyssal plain. And this whole thing is your mid-Atlantic rise, also called a, a mid-ocean ridge. That, in, that entire, let's use it for this, that entire uh, area is from here, from about here to here is your mid-ocean ridge. And right in the middle of that mid-ocean ridge is what is known as a rift valley. That is a rift valley. So we take this little area right in here and we cut it away, this is what we're looking at. And so your mid-ocean ridge is elevated above the abyssal plain here and the abyssal plain here. This whole thing is a mid-ocean ridge. And right in the middle, there's this little rift valley where magma wells up. And, and that's where we have volcanoes going on. They're, they're min very minimal. They're, uh, they have very mild types of eruptions. But you definitely have heat flow, heat flux. And again, satellites from space can see it. One of the ways we're able to determine this whole thing was happening is using satellite imagery. Um, but most divergent boundaries are along the crest of oceanic ridges. New ocean floor is generated when the mantle fills this narrow fracture. So again, you have the fracture, right? There is a fracture as this magma wells up, okay? As that magma wells up, it's going to fill in that fracture, but the two plates are still moving away. So that freshly created lithosphere, that magma that just filled in, it pulls apart, right? And then new magma flows up. And then it solidifies and it gets pulled apart. So it's easy to see where you're going to have nice young rocks right along the rift valley, right? And then as you move away, you'll have much, much older rocks. And because it's older and older and older, your sediment is going to be much thicker where it's older and much thinner where, of course, it is, it is uh, not as old. These are known as spreading centers. Here is that situation I mentioned with Iceland where it rises up so high off the sea floor that it actually pokes out as this island or actually a little group. There's a couple of small islands there. What you're looking at is this is the edge of the North American plate. And you're looking at this right here. That is the edge of the North American plate. All this is a North American plate. And everything over here is the Eurasian plate. And so this photograph that you're looking at is from somewhere right along this ridge. So this ridge is that mid-ocean ridge, and this is the rift valley. And of course, water is accumulated uh, down in that rift valley. And because the two are pulling apart, you get a subsiding block. That's very, very typical uh, whenever you have um, tensional forces on the crust. If, if rocks are being pulled apart, let me just let me draw this out for you very quickly. If, if rocks are being pulled apart, so here's my rock, all right, it's essentially flat. If it's being, if it splits and it's being pulled apart, all right, so it splits and it's being pulled apart, when this rock moves over here and this rock moves over here, this, this down, well, it, it just moves down, it subsides, it moves down, the, the, the blocks in between move down, and so you get these, these valleys, and we see that even the desert southwest, the basin and range area, the basins and the ranges, but essentially, 
Rifting causes that valley to form, and that's your rift valley. So most divergent plate boundaries are associated with oceanic ridges, the elevated seafloor with high heat uh, and volcanism, so you get a lot of uh, uh, magma flowing up. Um, it's the longest, as I said, topographical feature on Earth. Those ridges take up 20% of the Earth's surface, two to three kilometers higher than the adjacent basin, and they can be one to 4,000 kilometers um, wide. So this is, you know, this is a big feature. And of course, the Rift Valley is going to be a deep canyon along the crest of the ridge um, that forms because of those tensional forces, as I, as I explained. So two types of divergent boundaries, the seafloor spreading, which we just showed you, and then there's also continental rifting that you see uh, in, uh, in the East African uh, rift zone. So seafloor spreading is a process by which new seafloor is created along the ocean ridge. Typically five centimeters per year is what type of spreading you get, but it can be up to as much as 15 centimeters. The East Pacific rise is moving away from itself at 15 centimeters per year. Uh, new lithosphere is hot. It's less dense, but it cools and subsides with age and distance from the ridge system. So that new lithosphere is hot, and as it moves away from the, um, the, uh, the central ridge, it will get cooler and cooler and cooler. Um, but not only does it get cool, the lithosphere, but the asthenosphere below it gets cool, and it all sort of thickens up and hardens. So the thickness of that is going to depend on its age. Now, the other type of divergent boundary is the continental rifting. It occurs when divergent boundaries develop within a continent. Tensional forces stretch and thin that continental lithosphere. That brittle crust breaks into large blocks. Those central blocks drop down, creating the rift, uh, and the other blocks are pulled away, and eventually those rifts are filled with water. And again, in the East African rift zone, we have volcanoes, we have long linear lakes, the uh, Nile River essentially comes out of it, and so all those features are created. Um, here is that uh, continental process. So you have tensional uh, forces upwelling, kind of lifts the center section apart. Gravity pulls this side down, gravity pulls that side down. Tensional forces thins this out. Um, as the tensional forces pull it apart, the central blocks drop down, creating your rift valley. And eventually you get this linear sea that fills in. And long enough, this is deep geologic time, uh, you actually get an ocean. And this is essentially how the Atlantic Ocean formed between uh, Africa and South America, and between North Africa and Eurasia and North America, they were connected together as Pangaea in some rifting, upwelling of magma, a magma raised the central section of it, caused it to thin, tensional forces pulled it apart. First there's a linear sea, and then eventually you have uh, an actual ocean. And again, that takes, in this case, almost 200 million years for that to have happened. All right, convergent plate boundaries and their subduction zones. Uh, they occur when two plates move toward each other. Convergence rate is equal to the seafloor spreading on the opposite edge. Um, and its characteristics, the different types of subduction zones um, that are created are dependent on subducting crust. If you have a very old and very cold subducting crust, like out in the Western Pacific, some of that crust is upwards of 180 to 200 million years old it's going to dive pretty quickly, almost straight down. Whereas if you have a very young crust that's going to be not as cold and a little bit less dense, it's going to go down at, at a significantly lower angle. So uh, the lithosphere descends into the mantle because the lithosphere is, is um, the, the old oceanic crust is about 2% denser. So when it comes to oceanic crust converging, whether it's with other oceanic crust or with continental crust, because that oceanic crust is just a little bit denser than the asthenosphere, that oceanic lithosphere is going to descend down into the asthenosphere, um, and that's where it's eventually consumed. That subduction zone creates our deep oceanic trenches, whether they're in the middle of the ocean, like the Marianas and the Tongan Trench out uh, in the middle of the Western Pacific, or they're long linear trenches right along the, the uh, continents, like on the west side of South America or along Japan. And again, that angle of subduction depends on the density of the crust, that older crust being cooler and uh, more dense. So here's a typical uh, convergent zone where the oceanic crust is subducting underneath the lithosphere crust. Um, just so you know, the oceanic lithosphere, this whole piece here, that's not what melts to create the volcanoes. As that oceanic lithosphere and the oceanic sediments get pulled down, they get a lot of water in them and the pressure and heat literally dewaters. While water 
um, helps as a catalyst for chemical reactions. And so the water, that water coming out of this plate into this overlying sinus for this overlying mantle causes this mantle to melt. It's already very close to the melting zone, causes it to melt, and that's what wells up um, and creates some level of volcanism. Same thing happens when an oceanic and oceanic uh, merger happen. The older and colder plate subducts under the other, um, and you get your mantle wedge again, and that, that will well up underneath this oceanic lithosphere and create a chain of islands, volcanic islands that are oftentimes in an arc. And the third, oh, continental and continental, again, um, you have to imagine that before these two continents met, there was actually an ocean between them. So you started out with some oceanic lithosphere, and then behind it was continental lithosphere. As the oceanic lithosphere was subducted, eventually the two continental uh, sections or blocks met, and uh, they just sort of crumple and fold, and you get that mountain range as we have um, with the Himalayas. The oceanic continental convergence, uh, that subduction zone of oceanic lithosphere, it creates most of the volcanoes that we see above the surface of the Earth. And again, here is the subducting oceanic lithosphere. This is the subduction zone. It creates some type of little trench, even offshore of North America. We have a trench. As that plate subducts under, water is driven from the subducting plate, triggers melting of the mantle. That magma wells up, and uh, you get your, your, your volcanic range. Mount Hood, Mount Adams, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, right on up into Canada. The continental lithosphere is less dense and then the oceanic lithosphere, the oceanic lithosphere is a little bit more dense than the, than the asthenosphere, so it gets driven down into the asthenosphere. Water from that descending oceanic crust triggers partial melting in about 100 kilometers, and that molten material is less dense because it's hot, and it bubbles up to create those continental volcanic arcs. Continental volcanic arcs, as opposed to um, oceanic island arcs, volcanic island arcs. Uh, and here's that continental continental ver uh, convergence. First, um, the Indian, the Austro Indian plate was moving toward the Eurasian plate, or the Asian plate, uh, Eurasian plate, um, and there was an ocean in between them. The, uh, the oceanic lithosphere subducted underneath the continental lithosphere, but once that continental crust showed up, uh, the two just jammed into each other. And, and literally, India and the Tibetan plateau are still colliding, it's still going on right now. Um, 71 million years ago, 51 million years ago, where's my, there it is, 38 million years ago, 10 million years ago, and today, and they're still colliding. And, and this folding and deformation and faulting that occurred lifted the entire Tibetan plateau up. Your transform plate boundaries form when two plates slide horizontally past each other. Those are transform faults. No lithosphere is produced or destroyed. And they tend to connect spreading centers and offset oceanic ridges. You have to think about, you know, the Earth is, is round, so it's, it's going to be hard to have a straight line across a round Earth. And so the, the, the spreading centers get offset, and those transform faults connect those offset sections of the spreading center. So those breaks, those transform um, faults, are known as fracture zones, and they are not active. All right, They're, they may have some volcano, uh, not volcanoes, they do not have volcanoes. They may have some shallow earthquakes, but uh, again, they're not going to have volcanoes. So here is the mid-ocean ridge, and in that mid-ocean ridge, you do have volcanism. You do have magma welling up. But each of these gray lines is that fracture zone, the transform fault. So what you see happening is this section of oceanic crust is moving in that direction. So this is moving that way. This is moving that way, right? Now this oceanic crust is also moving that way, and that's moving that way. It's a spreading center. That is the rift valley, the rift valley, the rift valley with the magma. That one's going in that direction. That one's going in that direction. There's actually a transform boundary where one plate's moving this way and one plate's moving that way. Here, they're moving in the same direction, but they may be moving at slightly different speeds. And the same thing happens up here. These two are moving in the same direction. These two are moving in the same direction but these two are moving in opposite directions. So those are your fracture zones. Transform plate boundaries act to transport oceanic crust to the site of its own destruction. Here's one of those unusual little small plates, the Juan de Fuca plate. It is subducting up underneath the North American plate and the Pacific plate 
is actually moving along here. So the Pacific Plate's moving in this direction, the North American is, is here, and the Juan de Fuca is moving underneath it. So this, this uh, cutout here shows this space here. So everything from this Mendocino Fault, which is right here uh, in this direction, is going to be Pacific Plate. And so the Mendocino Fault is where this Juan de Fuca Plate is literally sliding by the Pacific Plate. And it's sliding by the Pacific Plate toward the North American Plate, where it's going to subduct underneath the North American Plate, and eventually it is going to be swallowed up down in the mantle. And of course, this is location, the Cascadia Subduction Zone, which is a nice deep trench there. This is location that creates the Cascade Mountain Ranges, and the mountains we talked about a few moments ago. Here is a transform fault on the continental crust. Typically, we find these transform faults down in the ocean and the oceanic plates. But here is right along the North American plate and the Pacific plate, where the two plates are sliding past each other. This is the San Andreas Fault. And again, you can see this river was flowing down and just how far it was offset by the sliding of the San Andreas Fault. Uh, way, 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 way over here. And so you do have transform plate boundaries in continental crust and the San Andreas and the Alpine Fault in New Zealand are those types of continental transform plate boundaries. All right, so how do plates and plate boundaries change the total surface area that is constant? The Earth's not getting bigger or smaller. So it's the size and the shapes of individual plates that do the changing. The African and the Antarctic plate are actually growing and they are surrounded by divergent boundaries. So everything around them is moving away from them. So they're getting bigger. The Pacific plate is being consumed. It's being surrounded by uh, convergent boundaries. So the Pacific plate in time, she gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And of course, plate boundaries do change and move through time. And so uh, here is a, um, a history of Pangaea, if you go back 200 million years when the rifting began. So the, the, the theory or the hypothesis here is that some upwelling began right in this region and lifted this section of Pangaea up. And because the upwelling was hot magma, it, was, it expanded, it was less dense, it lifted up this continental plate, this, this continental lithosphere, uh, this continental crust, and it caused the plate to split. And it split between Africa and South America, and Africa and North America, and Eurasia and North America, and that's where the split was. And because it was higher in the center, gravity pulled the plates in opposite directions. And so slowly, the Atlantic Ocean began to form. So the separation of North America and Africa was the first major event of the breakup of Pangaea, and the North Atlantic began to form. Then, about 90 million years ago, the South Atlantic opened up and the Southern Hemisphere began to break apart. And then we also saw India and Antarctica begin to pull away as well, all right? And then about 50 million years ago, Southeast Asia kind of hooked up. So this Southern part, South China up here, kind of hooked up with what was going on in Eurasia while India continued to move northward, right? India is part of this Australian plate. It began to move northward. 20 million years ago, India had began its collision, ongoing collision with Eurasia to create the Himalayas. And in the last 20 million years, Arabia has rifted. So here, Africa is solid. Uh, Arabia rifts. The Red Sea has been created. That started as a continental rift zone, part of the East African rift zone started as a rift valley, then maybe linear lakes. Those linear lakes have now turned into a linear sea. And theoretically, it's just going to continue to grow and grow and grow as this moves away from Africa. The Baja has begun to rift away from what is mainland Mexico to form the Gulf of California. If the present day plate motions continue, uh, the thinking is that ultimately it will all be, it'll come back together as a new supercontinent sometime in the future. And that, that cycle from a supercontinent here, Pangaea, 200 million years to plates all separated, to them all being smushed back together, that is known as a Wilson cycle. Wilson is the first scientist that actually described that. So let's talk about the evidence 
that led us to go from the theory of continental drift with the continents literally plowing through the oceans um, like icebreakers moving through ice to the theory of plate tectonics we have now. I talked about how after World War II, we began to see all this new data that was coming in from naval exploration. We saw the mid-Atlantic ridge, well, the mid-ocean ridges. We saw the trenches. We saw the deep earthquakes. Um, we began to see that there was thinner sediment near the ridges and thicker sediment out by the abyssal plains. And the evidence from deep sea drilling projects really helped us to see how core samples showed that the thickness increased with increasing distance, meaning assuming the thickness of the sediment is a function of how long sediment has been falling on a certain spot, the same layer of sediment got thicker and thicker and thicker as you move further and further away from the actual, the actual ridge where we are theoretically saying that lithosphere is being created. Sediment age also increased as you got further and further away from the ridge. The age of the sediment increased. As we said, the sediment got thickest. And the oldest seafloor, the very furthest distance from any ridge, has been measured to be about 180 million years old, where the sediments and the rocks very close to the ridges have essentially been aged to be brand new. Another interesting piece of evidence that gives support to the theory of tectonics is the way the Hawaiian Island slash Emperor Seamount chain have moved and um, moved along and increased distances and um, have, have changed locations. And so the Hawaiian Islands are part of a chain. We know the big islands, you know, Hawaii and Oahu and Maui and Molokai and Lanai. But there's a whole chain of smaller islands that go way out into the Pacific Ocean that actually turn right and almost go due north. So those islands, all of them, the entire chain, was formed as the Pacific Plate moved over a spot in the mantle, a spot where there was a cylinder of upwelling hot rock known as a mantle plume. And as that mantle plume pushed up, that's a cylinder, not an elongated thing, but it's, it's just this one blob of, of hot mantle pushed up underneath the seafloor, it broke through the seafloor, created a seamount that eventually became a an island. The youngest of those islands is the big island of Hawaii, down in the southeast corner. The oldest of the main islands is Kauai, up to the northwest, and then there's much, much older islands. So that upwelling hot rock is known as a mantle plume, creating a hot spot, an area of volcanism, high heat flow, and crustal uplift that's above the mantle plume. And that hot spot track is that line of islands that form. And so Kauai was formed two different volcanoes between 3.8 and 5.6 million years ago, Oahu 2.2. And so essentially the hot spot is here. So the hot spot is a fixed place. So this is the island of Hawaii, here's California. This is the island of Hawaii. And that cylinder of hot magma has been in the same place and it's bubbling up, not in an area really much larger than the island of Hawaii. It's basically originates and there's that cylinder of hot magma, you can see it there. It essentially originates from, the, I'm sorry, the mantle core boundary. And it originates from there and it bubbles up. And so it's remained almost fixed. It's the plate that has moved along it. And, and first the plate was moving north, and then it turned and started to move northwest. Because it was moving north, this island was formed first, then this island, then this island, then this island, then this island. And then there was the turn, and this island, this island. There's Midway Island, this island, this island, this island. Eventually you get down here to Kauai, and then Oahu, and then Molokai, and the Big Island, and Maui, Molokai, Maui, and the Big Island. And this is another piece of evidence that has shown us how the Pacific Plate has been moving in this direction. The final piece of evidence that locked down the overall theory of plate tectonics, we still have some questions about the driving mechanism, but the general theory was locked down by the evidence of paleomagnetism, or magnetism of the Earth's crust from the deep distant past. Today, North and South magnetic poles align approximately with the geographic North and South poles. So the minerals that are iron rich in the Earth's crust are actually influenced by those magnetic poles. There is a mineral known as magnetite 
that is uh, magnetic when it cools, but when it erupts in a basaltic uh, volcano, uh, is just above the point at which those minerals have magnetic properties. So uh, they're fluid. And as those uh, minerals cool and solidify and crystallize, the grains literally align themselves to the magnetic field during that process. And so essentially the rocks preserve a record of the direction of magnetic poles at the time of formation. This is paleomagnetism or fossil magnetism. Essentially, all of the basaltic flows occurring at divergent plate boundaries at seafloors today are producing basaltic mag magmas that are iron rich and have magnetite in them. And those magnetite grains, when they cool, align themselves to the current uh, magnetic flux of the earth what, with the north and south poles. The positions of paleomagnetic poles have appeared to change throughout time and what that means is as we look at different pieces of magnetite that are older, they tend to point to different locations on the Earth. And there was a time when scientists believed that that was a thing known as pole wandering, that the magnetic North Pole actually moved. And as we can see from this illustration, the actual geographic North Pole is here, the South Pole directly below it, and the magnetic North Pole is here. And these are the lines of, of magnetic flux that come in and out. But the reality is, most scientists believe now, that that point of magnetic north may have wandered gradually around the geographic north pole, but not in any significant way. And so the pole wandering that is seen in older and older rocks really is a function of continental drift. So if we go back 50 million years or I should say 500 million years ago, the North Pole was shown uh, to be here, actually closer to Hawaii in the rocks that are that old. But it's really not the fact that the pole was down here. The pole was really always pretty much at the North Pole. It's just the continents have moved. So scientists believe that the more westerly path uh, here in A is a function of the westward drift of North America from Eurasia by about 24 degrees. So what this is telling you is that uh, currently both rocks in North America and Eurasia point to what is the true magnetic North Pole very close to the geographic North Pole. But as we go back in time, 100 million years, 200 million years, there's different orientation of those magnetite crystals, but it's not because the poles wandered and wandered for different continents, but it's because the continents themselves were actually wandering. And so Paleomagnetism, or the location of the true magnetic north, is another piece of evidence that has shown the appearance that the magnetic north pole has changed is not because the pole itself has actually changed in its location to these spots, but because the continents have changed beneath it. The other piece of paleomagnetism is this notion of magnetic reversal, that our magnetic field of the Earth reverses polarity over these very large time scales. So rocks that form today have normal polarity. Their, their, their north is to the magnetic north pole. But there are rocks that show opposite magnetism or have actual reverse polarity. Now, again, polarity of lava flows with radiometric ages is something that's been used to generate what's known as a magnetic time scale, which is divided into these million year long divisions, and they find finer divisions within them. And, and what this is telling us is that it looks as though for about a million years at a time, rocks generally have normal polarity, with the North Pole being at the geographic North Pole. And then for maybe a million year period of time, rocks have had reverse polarity, with the North being at the geographic South Pole. And again, those time frames are not exactly a million years, but that general amount of time. They've also found that within that million year time frame, there's been these finer scales of reversal within the million year long uh, crons. And so what we have seen is that the polarity of the Earth's poles has reversed itself on certain time frames, either long or short. And then theoretically, those reversals should, should show up in the rock record. And these two scientists, Bynum Matthews in 1963, 
suggested that along our spreading centers in our divergent boundaries and our mid-ocean ridges, there should be stripes of normal and reverse polarity. And those stripes should be of equal size on either side of the ridge. Theoretically, there's an equal amount of magma that forms on either side of the rift valley that hardens on either side of the rift valley that moves away with the spreading center. And so positive polarity, normal polarity, or reverse polarity, there should be some very well-defined and, um, and fairly similar in size and very symmetrical stripes along the mid-ocean ridges. Well, before we had the mid-ocean ridges to work with, this scale of magnetic time, there's the crons, the slightly about million year crons, and there's four of them described over the last four million years, and that was based on lava flows from the shield volcano, where you had times of normal and reverse and then normal polarity. These same polarity reversals should show in the rocks on the ocean floor on either side of a mid-ocean ridge. So here is a mid-ocean ridge. This happens to be from the Juan de Fuca. This is the ridge axis. This is the rift valley in which magma is actually flowing up. As um, both uh, as the, the oceanic crust, lithospheric crust uh, plate that is, slides down uh, down the ridge and gets actually pulled into the uh, the uh, subduction zone where this is moving under North America. As new magma forms, it moves away, and there's a stripe on either side of that rift valley that is your normal polarity. But then we see a stripe a very similar size on either side that is reverse, and then again there is the normal, and then there's the reverse and the normal. And it's this, this uh, development of normal polarity, reverse polarity, normal polarity, ver reverse polarity, and then the mapping that we can do on either side of that ridge that really was the last piece of evidence. It really solidified this theory of plate tectonics. And again, here is your, your young um, rift valley with a, a narrow sea, maybe like the Red Sea, where you have normal polarity right at the, uh, the ridge, uh, the oceanic ridge, and then reverse polarity. And then as this whole process continues through deep geologic time, the ocean basin gets wider and wider and wider, and you have these stripes of reverse and normal polarity. And the, when the new basaltic rocks form, they magnetize according to the existing magnetic field. And so the ocean crust provides this permanent record of magnetism reversals over about 200 million years. Because remember, the oceanic crust is only about 200 million years old. And so that paleomagnetism really was the last sort of uh, nail to just lock down this concept of plate tectonics. But the big problem with continental drift was that, uh, that Wegener did not have a good natural mechanism to explain why it was happening. And what most scientists believe now is the mechanism that drives plate tectonics is some level of convection. And what they're talking about is convection in the mantle. So if we can we can sort of accept that this pot of water, and a pot of water works by a heating element, is in contact with the bottom of the pot. Conduction transfers heat from the heating element to the bottom of the pot. The pot transfers heat to the very bottom layer of water. That layer of water heats up and expands, becomes less dense, more buoyant, rises to the surface, rises to the surface, and gets to the surface where it may actually cool off and become dense and sink back down, and that's a convection cell. So if we can imagine that what we're looking at here is oceanic crust, most scientists believe that plate tectonics is, is driven by convection cells in the magma, where magma wells up from somewhere in the mantle, whether it's from the core mantle boundary or from the shallower layer, wells up, it lifts up the oceanic lithosphere, it lifts it up, it rises up, and then gravity helps to begin to move it away. And as gravity moves it away, then that magma solidifies and more magma wells up. At the same time in this process, we believe that our plates are actually uh, subducting. So that was our, our mid-ocean ridge here, and the two plates are moving in two different directions. And then over somewhere else, the plates are subducting down. And these plates are young here and old here. So they're 
they're warm and less dense and cold and more dense here. And, and actually those old oceanic plates, as we know, are more dense actually than the asthenosphere. So they're heavier than the asthenosphere. So once they get pulled or pushed down into the asthenosphere, gravity literally pulls them down. And that's the other aspect of this conservation of mass, where mass is destroyed by descending plates and then mass is created where they rise up uh, um, in our magma plumes. And so essentially, scientists believe that convection cells of some sort drive plate tectonics. And again, convection, hot, less dense material rises and cool material sinks. So slab pull, this slab pull is that cold, dense oceanic crust sinking down into the asthenosphere and ridge push is the gravity pushing the slab toward, towards its subduction zone. Um, and, and the whole thing is one big convection cell. So here are the general forces that are gonna drive our plate tectonic motion. Uh, and again, we are talking about uh, slab push, gravity pushing the slab downhill, and then slab pull gravity pulling the slab down into the asthenosphere because this slab is more dense than the material surrounding it. And it looks like slab pull is, is likely the greater of the two forces involved in this, but we have a downward motion of cooler, dense lithospheric, and then an upward motion of warm, hot mantle magma. And that is your conservation cell. That is essentially your, your convection cell. Ridge push is gravity driven force that pushes that slab down, and then slab pull is a gravity-driven force that pulls that slab down into the asthenosphere. Then the question becomes, how deep does that convection cell go? And this is the part of plate tectonics, which we don't know everything. And this is the part of, part of plate tectonics in which is an opportunity for students now to do research and be the ones that determine exactly what's happening. We know that mantle convective flow drives plate motion. We know that subducting plates are driven downward. That's the downward component of convection, of that slab pull. We know that upwelling of hot rock and oceanic ridges drives the upward component of the convection. We know that convective flow is the heat transfer mechanism from the Earth's interior. So the hot Earth interior is what drives this flow. The question is, there are two different general models that we have conceptions of right now. One is the whole, whole mantle convection, and one is the layer cake, which is just the top layer of the mantle. So in the whole mantle convection model, cold oceanic lithosphere sinks all the way to the core mantle boundary, stirring the entire mantle, and that's balanced by buoyant mantle plumes. In the layered cake model, there's only a thin dynamic layer in the upper model, a thick, larger sluggish layer below only uh, conducts heat upward and that subducting plates only sink to about a thousand kilometers. So two very different concepts. And so this is the whole mantle model in which hot spots come from the core mantle boundary, in which plumes of magma rise up from the core mantle boundary and drive spreading centers, and the entire core is involved in that convection cell. And then the layered cake model says that the largest portion of of the mantle is just this sluggish flow up, taking heat through conduction up through the mantle, that the actual convection occurs in this thin, maybe 1,000 kilometer layer of the upper mantle associated with the lithospheric plates. But again, scientists don't know for certain. Nobody's been down here to watch. Nobody's been down here to be able to take empirical evidence uh, to make observations. So perhaps you are the one that is going to be able to uh, figure out what is the correct model of plate mantle convection? All right, so that was chapter five of Foundations of Earth Science, the eighth edition. Of course, the textbook by Pearson Education from Lutkins and Tarbuck. Chapter five talked about plate tectonics, that grand unifying theory of geology. As we move forward, we're gonna to begin to talk about the larger processes that are a function of plate tectonics. And in chapter six, we're gonna talk about earthquakes and mountain building, one of the primary processes of plate tectonics. So we'll see you for chapter six.